Jasmine Fahid Sama. And we're going to talk about silent mutation. So basically, science, what we're told in science classes today is that we can take any stretch of DNA and put it into any other organism that it shouldn't belong in and have it work in that organism. But what often happens in real life experimentation is that the DNA doesn't work or even that it makes completely the wrong protein. And then you have a bunch of scientists banging their heads against the wall trying to figure out what went wrong. And the answer to all that frustration might lie in a recent series of discoveries about silent mutations. And, but before we actually get into our topic, we're gonna do a little bit of review, just so everybody's on the same page as to what's actually going on. Um, so our, uh, every creature on this planet has something called DNA in them. And it's basically a blueprint of how we are, what we look like, and what makes us different. Uh, it stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it's composed of four bases called adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, or A, T, G and C for short. And it's a double-stranded molecule. So on each side, each base has to line up with another. So the A would line up with the T, and then the G would line up with the C. Um, to make a protein, what would happen is your DNA first has to unzip, which makes space for the cell to create a new molecule called RNA. And RNA is, um, has the same bases as DNA, except it has uracil or U instead of the T that DNA has. So after that um, RNA molecule is made, it will fold up and it will leave the center of the cell called the nucleus. And it will have to, uh, after, before it leaves the center of the nucleus, it has to be edited though. Uh, so what will happen is a process called splicing. So um, what it does is the cell will cut out um, not parts that are not important for making a protein. And after it, it does that, it will take the parts required for making a protein into one final messenger RNA, or mRNA. Now that mRNA will have to leave the nucleus and go to another part of the cell called a ribosome. Inside it will bind to the ribosome and then another molecule called tRNA will bind to every set of three bases called codons. Uh, each TR tRNA has an amino acid, which is a building block of a protein. And as they line up along the mRNA strand, it will form a nice long chain of amino acids, and then it will create one protein at the end. Um, as you can see here, each codon represents one amino acid. And there's a prob um, approximately uh, 64 possible combinations that you can make with all the base pairs. But there's only 20 amino acids in existence, or at least as far as we know. Um, and you can see here, um, all of these, these are all different codons, but they all stand for the same amino acid. So if a mutation occurred, it wouldn't be a big deal in affecting the protein. I mean, the structure would still be the same. It had the same bases. And you can even see here, the whole, this line is identical to that line, despite the fact that the mutation occurred there. So you would think it's not a big deal if there's silent mutation occurred, right? But reality is silent mutations do make a difference in the way a protein is expressed in an in a organism. Okay, so that's the basic, our basic topic and the intro. And now we can actually get into the fun part. So there's three points in the protein making process when silent mutations do make a difference. Splicing, mRNA folding, and protein folding. And Jasmine will take us into splicing. So splicing, as said before, is when the mRNA, when the RNA is being edited. And it will um, cut out non, um, not, not as important parts called introns. And then the exons are the part that has information about the protein. Uh, the cell has to uh, cut it by recognizing basically on the sequence. However, if there's a mutation in the pre-mRNA, um, the cell will not be able to recognize where to cut it, and it may cut out vital parts. It may, for example, leave in part of an intron, or it may cut out an exon. In fact, there have been studies shown relating to um, cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic disorder that causes mucus buildup in your lungs. Uh, so what happens, uh, a scientist conducted an experiment. He mutated um, several cells and about, um, with a particular codon, uh, so this is what it should look like. And then this is for a regular healthy person. 
they uh, have exon 12 included. Uh, however, when he mutated it, he noticed that about 25% of those mutated cells expressed the cystic fibrosis. Um, and turns out that the silent mutation occurred caused th this vital exon to be left out and thus affected the expression of the cell. Uh, another point in which silent mutations can affect the way a protein functions is during mRNA folding. So before mRNA can leave the nucleus of the cell, it has to fold up nicely uh, so that it can uh, be safe on its journey to the ribosome. Otherwise, the cell would probably destroy it on accident. And mRNA folds by pairing up uh, the bases just like DNA would, So, except it's turning in on itself. So A pairs with T and C pairs with G. And it creates these really complicated structures behind it. But what happens when you have a silent mutation is that the mRNA will fold differently, and it might fold too tightly. And if it folds too tightly, then it can't unwind again for the ribosome to make a protein out of it. So you'll have very, very little protein. If it binds too loosely, then it'll probably get either destroyed on the way to the ribosome, or it'll unfold too quickly, which will make too much protein. And here we have a really common example of mRNA folding that affects pretty much everybody in their daily life. And that example is pain tolerance. So different people can tolerate different levels of pain. Um, so for somebody wearing high-heeled shoes like these would hurt a lot. And for me, it doesn't actually hurt that much. Uh, but uh, for a long time, scientists didn't know what caused this, this difference in pain tolerance. And so they thought that low pain tolerance, which means you can't tolerate pain very well, uh, was one mutation. And high pain tolerance, people who tolerate pain very well, was a different mutation. But it turns out that when they actually did studies on this, they found that it was all the same mutation, this purple one right here. So what's the difference between these two extremes then? Further tests recently showed that it's this blue code on here, this blue change. Uh, and this is what causes the difference between the structure on the far left and the structure on the far right. So the structure closer to me, that's high pain tolerance, that is very tight. And yeah, high pain tolerance uh, makes protein easily. And low pain tolerance makes protein very slowly. And the protein is what lets you tolerate pain. That's what kind of calms down your cells and tells them you're OK, you're not dying. Um, so if, you have, if you're making a lot of that protein, you can tolerate pain. And if you're not, you can't. And we move on. So the last part is about protein folding. So protein, what, proteins, because remember how they said there's a long, they are, consist of a long chain of amino acids? Well, the way they interact with each other affects the way they fold as well. Uh, as you can see, this is what it, it's full as it's being made. So it comes out as a long chain, and it will fold up into this really globular structure. Um, what happens is um, there, uh, when a, nu a change happens in the the, nucle the nucleotide mutation, silent mutation occurs. Uh, it'll affect the way that the amino acids interact with each other, and it'll affect the way that it folds in on itself. Um, it also uh, there was also um, a recent. Um, uh, the, the codon can also affect, the, the sound mutation can affect the rate at which the protein is being made because uh, it's folding as it's being made. And uh, so for example, if uh, some codons are more common than others, while, and, and then the rare ones, uh, it's harder to find their respective tRNA molecule. Now, if a mutation occurs and it turns a, uh, a common codon to a rare one, it'll slow the rate at which the pr um, protein can be made, and it will affect the way it folds. And it'll, as a result, it will produce less protein. In fact, there was an experiment conducted with the bacteria E. coli. And uh, what, this, what the team of scientists did is they put five of the mutated codons that coded for the same amino acid as the common one, as the more common one. And what happened was that the Non-mutated E. coli produce a relatively normal amount of protein, but the mutated ones produce actually less protein. And also, they were non-functional. So it really shows how the effect of a silent mutation can have on the function of a protein. So we've gone over theory, and we
we've given you some examples, but you're probably wondering why this is such an important discovery. Well, it turns out that uh, silent mutations are actually, it's important, important to consider them in quite a few areas of science. For example, like in the example that I gave you in the beginning, uh, genetic engineering often uh, has to account for silent mutations. Part, uh, the reason being that what might be a common and normal sequence in one organism, when you transplant it into a different organism, that organism will sort of treat it like a mutation because it uses different codons than the first organism is used to. So when scientists transplant one gene from, it from one organism into the other, they have to make sure that all the codons are the correct ones for the host organism. And this is a process called optimization. Uh, I, I want to mention really quickly an ingenious use of optimization that was used to make the new polio vaccine. So polio is a virus which can uh, affect nerve cells and cause people to become paralyzed. And quite a while ago, we developed a vaccine for it. But that vaccine was never really safe because it uses a living, functioning virus. And that virus can actually cause people to become sick if it multiplies out of control in your cells. So a team of scientists at Stony Brook University set out to make a safer polio vaccine. And what these scientists did is they took all the, almost all the codons that are common in the human body where the virus reproduces and they replace them with rare ones. And what that did is the virus can still function, the immune system still recognizes it and becomes immune to it, but it functions in slow motion. So it, since it's multiplying so slowly, the body has time to kill the virus before it becomes a problem, before it makes the person sick. And the reason I feel this is such a clever use of uh, optimization is because it's basically optimization in reverse. You're taking all the worst codons that you can think of and putting them in there. As, um, since optimization, as you can sort of tell, is so important in genetic engineering, there's whole companies that have sprung up to optimize proteins, optimize genes. Researchers will send in the genes that they need optimized and the, the purpose that they intend to use them for. And these companies will calculate the sequences that'll work the best for that purpose. And because they have huge da data banks and because every time that they calculate a sequence, they get feedback on whether their calculations actually worked, uh, after a while they get really good at finding the best sequences. And that saves scientists a lot of time and money and so they can do more experiments because they don't have to use trial and error to find the codons that actually work the way they're supposed to. So another way that um that this new information is useful is in a relatively new treatment for patients called gene therapy. So what happens in gene therapy is uh, it's meant for humans that can't produce no that normal proteins that a healthy or a normal human can produce. Uh, so what, they, uh, what the treaters try to do is they get a virus and they insert it with the gene that they lack and then they insert that virus into the, the patient and hopefully it'll or, um, it give the patient the new gene. Uh, the reason why that this knowledge of silent mutation is useful is that th they need to make sure that both the patient and the virus can successfully produce this protein if it were inserted into them. Uh, so that, that way you'll make sure that the patient will be okay. Another way that um, this new information about silent mutations is useful is, be, as previously mentioned, they seem to have some link with genetic disorders. Uh, so about, um, there's about 50 uh, genetic disorders that have been linked to some form of silent mutation and approximately five to, appro uh, every gene has like five to 10% of coding region that actually has a region that if a silent mutation occurs there can affect an, um, the person in a very negative way. And these are just some examples of diseases that are caused by silent mutations you can see. Uh, cancer is up there. So it's quite important to study uh, further into silent mutations and figure, and figure out uh, more roles that they play and uh, how they affect proteins. Um, and that pretty much sums up our presentation. Uh, we hope that everybody learned something new and hopefully had some fun. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>